Good morning. If you turn in your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. It is Mother's Day and I want to do what Ephesians 6 2 says and that is to honor our mothers. Uh, My mother is an amazing and kind uh, woman for whom I am deeply grateful. And so uh, for all the mothers here, if you would just raise your hand so we can see you and acknowledge that you are a mother. Raise them high. Why are you ashamed to be a mother? <laughs> Raise your hand. And can we just say thank you to these mothers? <laughs> this morning, our context will be 1 Thessalonians 2, verses 1 through 8, and we'll focus in on verses 7 and 8. So look with me in chapter 2 of 1 Thessalonians, beginning in verse 1. For you yourselves know, brethren, that our coming to you was not in vain, but after we had already suffered and been mistreated in Philippi, as you know, we had the boldness in our God to speak to you the gospel of God amid much opposition. For our exhortation does not come from error or impurity or by way of deceit, but just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. So we speak, not as pleasing men, but God who examines our hearts. For we never came with flattering speech, as you know, nor with a pretext for greed. God is witness. Nor did we seek glory from men, either from you or from others, even though as apostles of Christ we might have asserted our authority. But we proved to be gentle among you, as a nursing mother tenderly cares for her own children. Having so fond an affection for you, We were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives, because you had become very dear to us. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this text. Thank you for this book. Thank you for the Bible. This word that you have breathed out for our instruction to make us wise unto salvation to give us light to our path as we walk this life of faith. God, thank you for every word you have recorded. And for this morning, God, thank you for this text. And I pray and ask for your great help to us, God, to both proclaim this and to hear it in our hearts, that we would see Christ, that we would be conformed to Christ, that we would be encouraged in Christ, that Christ would be lifted up, that we would see him and worship him. God, be with us and help us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. As we open up this text, I want to first make three general observations regarding motherhood in the Bible. And then specific to 1 Thessalonians 2, 7 and 8, I want to unpack three ways that gospel ministry, and really specifically missions, must be modeled after motherhood. Must be modeled after motherhood. I also want to acknowledge that, every, that not everyone here still has a mother that's living. And so Mother's Day can be a bittersweet remembrance. And I want you to be encouraged this morning as we we will examine motherhood, but we're going to take that and it's going to capture us up into the Godhead. So I hope that you're encouraged by his grace through his word. And for others, the very mention of the word mother brings back very difficult and painful memories. Not everyone's mother was a good mother, a faithful mother. And so I hope to address that very issue in our text. And I hope you'll be encouraged by what motherhood ultimately is all about. There are no perfect mothers, but there is a perfect God who loves perfectly and a perfect Christ. Who Paul says in Colossians 2.10, that in him we are made complete. Not, Not in our mother's love. But in Christ alone, we are whole and complete and have everything that we need. So first, three general observations regarding motherhood. First is this, motherhood is from God. It's not an evolutionary design. It's not from Mother Earth. The very idea of motherhood is from God. He created it. He made it up. And we derive the benefit of it even when we didn't know we were deriving the benefit of it as infants. In Genesis 127, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. 
And God blessed them and and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Therein lies the framework for motherhood. And then in Genesis 4, the first baby is born. The first mother is called into action. Genesis 4.1. Eve conceived and gave birth to Cain. And she said, I have gotten a man child with the help of the Lord. And then all through the Bible, God affirms this design, his design. From Genesis 1.31, where he declares everything to be very good. To the fifth commandment in Exodus 20, where he affirms motherhood and, and he commands us to honor our father and mother. The individual, but the individual in the role of mother. And then if you would, turn with me to John chapter 19, because I want us to see Not just that Jesus honored his mother, but how and when he honored his mother. The context of John 19 is Jesus dying on the cross. And his mother was important to him even in those moments. In the midst of bearing the sins of his people and enduring the wrath of God, dialed in beyond imagination and focused on the most difficult and torturous moments anyone has ever known, Jesus turns his attention to his mother. He does not forget her and he cares for her because he loves her. John 19, 25. But standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus then saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, behold your mother. From that hour, the disciple took her into his own household. In the midst of atoning for sin, Jesus assigns the responsibility of his mother to John the apostle. Do you have time for your mother? Jesus had time for his mother, accomplishing redemption, dying on the cross. Motherhood is from God. Second observation generally from the Bible is that motherhood reflects the nature of God. He created it to manifest and highlight certain aspects of himself. It is an an expression of the image of God that we bear. Together, both men and women are made in the image of God. We are made like him. Not divine, but divinely reflective. We bear that stamp of his image. The difference between the blazing hot sun and a mirror that reflects that sun. We are mirrors. But we manifest the image of God differently, to different degrees. We express it uniquely according to our gender in some instances. Motherhood reflects the nature of God, but in such a way that in no way violates or confuses God as Father. Or Jesus as son. As we'll see in our text, motherhood points us to and reflects many of the key facets of the nature of God. Many of the essential aspects of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then thirdly and finally, generally observing the the Bible and practically experiencing motherhood. Motherhood is wonderfully mysterious. And and I put in my notes, to men. I'm not sure it's mysterious to women. It is mysterious to men. And because I'm a man and never will be a a mother, I have to qualify that. Uh, Motherhood is wonderfully mysterious to men. And so we we would say, and I'm speaking as a man, wow, God God built this into every woman. It's, It's in their database. It's in their operating system. Men can at best observe motherhood and take notes. But, men, but, but, but women, it flows out of them. It's, it's, it's in there. I learned about motherhood from my mother, from my grandmother, from my great-grandmother. Strong women of faith. Gentle, sacrificial servants. I learned about it, but I don't quite understand it on the inside. Because ultimately, I can't. Here's the obvious example. And ladies, you profoundly understand this. My wife does this to me sometimes, and this is not a criticism of her, it's a criticism of me. She's holding a baby in the church. Someone has a baby, and she's holding the baby. And she approaches me with the baby, with these wide eyes and this really happy face, and she says, do you want to hold the baby? (laughs) And this is how I'm thinking. I like babies, okay. I don't have anything against babies. They're nice. 
and they're cute, but here's what I think of when a baby is coming at me with my wife smiling. This is what I'm thinking. If I take this baby, the baby may begin to cry. And then it will appear that I did something to the baby, that I was insufficient for the baby. If I take the baby, the baby may spit up. It's a very real possibility. If I take the baby, the baby may create an odor that is unpleasant, that opens up a whole other scenario that I don't want to get involved with at the time. But you bring a baby into a room full of women, and you have thrown a piece of raw meat into the middle of a pack of wolves. <laughs> my turn, my turn. This is the best pickup line for a baby. Oh, I think he wants me to hold him. No, no he doesn't. No, he doesn't. Women will play all sorts of games to get their hands on that baby. Get in line, sister, I was here first. And I've seen godly women become a little less godly trying to get their hands on a baby. So herein lies the mystery, I don't understand that. But men, we bow in reverence for how God has designed women. And I love it and I embrace it. And young men, don't worry. Because if God blesses you with a wife and children in the future, don't worry about your inability to understand the mystery. Get ready to see an incredible transformation of your wife to mother. When they, when they first put my, my first daughter into my wife's arms in the hospital, when they first handed her Abby, I guarantee you that lightning struck that woman. And the window flew open and Thor's hammer came in and she embraced it. And on that hammer it said, mother. And she's been wielding that as a superhero ever since that first moment. I didn't get a hammer. I got nothing. And so dads are trying to, we're trying to mother, but you guys mother, capital M. My wife had very little experience, but she had instinct and desire that God put in her as a woman. And that is mysterious. And it is wonderfully beautiful the way God has designed. To 1 Thessalonians 2 now, a little background on this letter. Paul established the church in Thessalonica on his second missionary journey in 50 AD. And Acts 17 explains that. As we narrow in then, Really, verses 1 through 12 in chapter 2, we have Paul reviewing and defending the manner in which they ministered to the Thessalonians. Nothing is mentioned in this section regarding the content of what was said. But his emphasis in this text is on the way the ministry was conducted. The first six verses are generally what the ministry was not characterized by. Seven things, not from error, impurity, deception. It wasn't man-pleasing. It wasn't based on flattering speech greed, or getting glory from men. All of these were most likely accusations that were made against Paul by the Jews that were there, trying to discredit the ministry. And then he turns in verse 7 to what the ministry was characterized by. Verses 1 through 6, this is what we weren't, but then verse 7, but this is what we were. And so we'll focus on verses 7 and 8. These 12 verses of chapter 2 have a, of a parenting thread woven throughout this section. Here in verse 7, he mentions motherhood. And then again, again in verse 11, he reference, references ministering to them like a father. And so parenting really generally is the overarching analogy. Paul is also describing first and foremost his ministry as an apostle in a missions context. He, he went there to bring the gospel for the first time and to establish churches but it overflows into the care and the shepherding of the church. And I'm convinced it applies to just generally the way we minister to people. And so there's room in this text for every single one of us. It's a Mother's Day sermon that applies to every single person. And so let's unpack these three facets of gospel ministry. Three ways gospel ministry must model motherhood. And men, if you're, if you're concerned that I'm about to encourage you from the text to act like a woman, to act like a mother, I want you to be very clear. I absolutely am. Because using the analogy, Paul is asking us to act like Jesus. To not just reveal the message of God, but the very heart of God. And in the wisdom of God, he chose motherhood in this context to illustrate that. This has nothing to do with confusing gender roles. The text is not asking us to deny or violate our gender. 
So be a man. And in these categories, learn from motherhood and imitate motherhood as a man in your ministry to others. And ladies, mothers, excel still more at how God has made you. The first way that gospel ministry must model motherhood is this. Gospel ministry must be gentle ministry. In verse 7, but we prove to be gentle among you as a nursing mother tenderly cares for her own children. When we think of gospel, gospel ministry, we can think in certain categories that are true and biblical but may not be exhaustive. And this word, this text, helps us balance the picture we envision. The word here means gentle, it means kind. When we think of gospel ministry, especially men, we think of missions and church planting. We can think in terms of military maneuvers, logistics, boots on the ground, strategic planning, airdrops of resources, people parachuting in with their Bibles to fight for the truth. As a man, I can think of parenting the exact same way. If it wasn't for my wife, my house would look more like a military base than it would like a happy home. Remember the guy in Sound of Music with the whistle that marched his kids around and had daily inspections? I love that guy. (laughs) But that is neither the context for parenting, nor is it the context for gospel ministry. The gospel was preached for sure in Thessalonica. But our text tells us the heart and the compassion and the manner in which it was communicated. Don't turn there, but listen to Acts 17. This is the the raw data of the gospel being proclaimed in Thessalonica. Acts 17, 2. And according to Paul's custom, he went to them and for three Sabbaths, Sabbaths reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and giving evidence that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead, and saying, this Jesus who I am proclaiming to you is the Christ. Now our text in 1 Thessalonians then It says how they did this. They did this gently, with kindness. They weren't obnoxious. They weren't fighting. They weren't arguing, belligerent, or distant. Paul says, we were among you like a nursing mother tenderly cares, caring for her own children. As a man, I don't see that in Acts 17. And so 1 Thessalonians 2 is such a wonderful um, balancing for gospel ministry. It's both a rebuke and an instruction to my own heart. The word for tenderly cares means to cherish, to warm up, to keep warm, to nurture. There is a fragility to a newborn. And they require this kind of tender, careful, gentle, and kind care. Is that how you deal with people when you minister to them? In the the large capacity or in the smallest conversations? Do you think of and treat your foul-mouthed neighbor that drinks too much like he was your child and needed tender care? When Mormon missionaries show up and they knock on your door and they want to bring in a false gospel, are you gentle and kind? Or do you slam the door and say, no, thank you. Next house. A kind answer not only turns away wrath, it invites people in. It's attractive. It displays the effects of the gospel in us. And so this is an essential question for us as believers. Not just that we are, are we gentle and kind, but what makes us gentle and kind? How do we get this? You and I will become kinder and gentler as we consider God's dealings with us in Christ. How kind and gentle is Christ to us? In our rebellion, in our foolishness, in our waywardness, he comes gently to us. He is a kind, kind Savior. And he appeals to to his gentleness to us. Even in the invitation of the gospel, Matthew 11, 28, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Why? For I am gentle. And humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. It turns the gospel on its head to present a gentle Christ in an angry way. Gentleness is the only train track on which the gospel message should travel. It's the only megaphone through which we can announce the good news. 
It's not optional. Anything less than tender, mother-like gentleness misrepresents the Christ that we're preaching. Romans 2.4. Or do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness and tolerance and patience, not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance? How did we get here? Did someone yell you into the kingdom? Did someone argue with you until you finally yielded and on your knees, beat down and defeated, you believed in Christ? Hebrews 13.7 says, Remember those who led you, who spoke the word, of God to you, and considering the result of their conduct, imitate their faith. 2 Timothy 2.24, the Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome, but be kind. Same word in our context. Must be kind to all. The servant of the Lord, whether it's a pastor or, 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 or not, must be kind to all. Is gentleness not your spiritual gift? It's not mine either. Do you know why? Because it's not a spiritual gift. It is the fruit of the Spirit of God in every believer as we walk humbly with him and abide in him. As I behold a gentle Christ, he makes me and transforms me into a gentle man. And yet I probably repent more of not being gentle than any other sin in my life. Motherhood is perhaps the best temporal demonstration of this kindness and gentleness, but Jesus is the fullness of this. He is the ultimate reality and demonstration of kindness and gentleness. And he gently forgives my lack of it. And he empowers me by his spirit to be what I am not, gentle and kind. And so there is hope for the crotchety and there is hope for the rough in Christ. Would we see greater fruit in our evangelism and ministry if our methods and our manner was as fine-tuned as our message? Gospel ministry must be gentle ministry. Second way that gospel ministry must be modeled after motherhood is that gospel ministry must be affectionate ministry. Look in verse 8. Having so fond an affection for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives because you had become very dear to us. I'm convinced the analogy of verse seven continues on. It overflows into verse eight and perhaps beyond. These are unique terms for ministry, I'll admit, they, but they are essential descriptions, gentleness, tenderness. Here in verse eight, so fond an affection, you became very dear to us, motherhood. Not many people speak this way, especially men. When was the last time someone said to you, man, I have such a fond affection for you. You are so very dear to me. Whether we use those terms or not is not the issue. This should be the affection we both experience and display in ministering to others. So fond an affection, it means to desire strongly and persistently to have great affection for. And this word for very dear, it just simply means loved, beloved. It's the same word, the voice from heaven comes in Matthew 3, 17. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. It is God the Father's affection for Christ. Why must we have and display such great affection for people in gospel ministry? Because simply this is how God feels about us. It is the very nature of God displayed to us in Christ. This is how God loves us with great affection. We are his dear ones. And we are free to demonstrate that affection to others because we have been born again and set free from the death that was within us. God is not distant to us. He's not removed. He's not cold. But oh, how he loves us. Tenderly, personally, gently, with great affection. We are so dear to him in Christ, and yet we don't deserve any of it. Motherhood primes the pump for this kind of love. But the gospel brings the tidal wave of its fullness, the love of God. 1 John 3 says, says, see how great a love. Look at it. Consider it. See how great a love the Father has bestowed on us that we would be called children of God. He loves us. He's not silent about it in the text. He's not mysterious about the degree to which he loves us. 
The intensity, the consistency, the intimacy, his love knows no bounds and it never ends for his children. In Romans 1, 7, Paul writes the letter to all who are beloved of God in Rome. Same word, to all those who are loved by God, the ones that God loves in Christ. His love is the ocean that we swim in and so why and how can we sometimes feel so dry in that ocean? Why, if this is the way that God loves me with such intense and great and burning affection, why do I sometimes not feel loved and feel alone? And then the effect of that is that our ministry to others becomes unaffectionate and sometimes cold and not tender and not gentle. And it's anything but motherhood emulating. Motherhood models for us this kind of affectionate love. And so I just want to share just briefly what I experientially know of this kind of love from exclusively from my mother. And and I'm sure many of you will identify with this. This is what my mother did for me growing up. She raised me with great sacrifice. She gave herself up for me. Time and energy and money and worry and concern and hope and pain and suffering. Is there a greater ongoing quiet sacrifice, temporally speaking, not considering the cross, than the sacrifice of a mother. I, I, do, I don't know of one. She is and always will be with me in this life. As long as she is alive, that's a guarantee for me. She's proven it over and over again. There is an unbreakable commitment from my mother to me. When I consider Hebrews 13, 5, where God says, I will never leave you or forsake you, I think of my mom. Oh, oh, you mean like that, God? You mean like the way that my mother loved me and is committed to me, like that kind of intense commitment? When I think of Psalm 139, 17, how precious also are your thoughts to me, O God, how vast is the sum of them. If I should count them, they would outnumber the sand. My understanding of that passage is to first consider my mother's thoughts for me, her constant awareness. And I use that temporal reality, that experience that I have growing up as a springboard to grasp the eternal love of God for me in Christ, his thoughts of me in Christ. And that all of this was born out of her love for me, a mother's love. It is perhaps the best expression of horizontal agape love we can experience in this life. My definition of motherhood from that experience, and I know it's just, it's feeble and it's a, it's a, just a facet, but this is my definition of motherhood. Knowing and believing that my mom would do absolutely anything for me, absolutely anything but loving her so much in return that I never wanted to take advantage of that love. I didn't want to disappoint her. I didn't want to use her or manipulate her. Great love that produced a great response of love. My mom's love for me makes me want to honor her. But sadly, I know that not everyone has had that experience. Their mom may represent anything except that kind of love. You mentioned mother, and it may trigger abandonment. Where was she? Abuse. And our hearts should break for that. That is not the way it's supposed to be, but sadly too often that is the way it is. But not having the temporal experience and the example of one expression of human love, however vital or important that love is, in no way limits you from the fullness of the love and commitment of God to you in Christ through the gospel in this life or the next. I want to say that again. It in no way limits you from the fullness of the love and the commitment of God to you in Christ through the gospel in this life or the next. Meaning whatever you missed in the earthly picture, God redeems that in Christ. You don't have to miss the divine fullness The power of the gospel overcomes your experience. And so forgive and press on and drink this full love that God has for you in Christ. People can say, I didn't have a mother that loved me 
or a father that loved me, so I'm broken goods. I'll never be able to fully experience the love of God. So now how can I love with that kind of affection and commitment to others in Christ by the power of the gospel? I want to give you two promises regarding the love of God. The first promise is in Romans 5.5. 5. And hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. First promise, it's finished. He loves you. He's already emptied the pitcher. That's what the text says. It's true. It's real. God is asking us to believe that by faith. Meaning I have the capacity and I have the responsibility to believe that God loves me regardless of my human experience. But every Christian here today to some degree doubts that love, questions it for all kinds of reasons specific to my circumstances and to your circumstances. So what are we to do? We are to fight by faith to believe that promise. Romans 5.5 five, because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts. He loves you. Whether you believe it, whether you've experienced it in the past, he loves you right now in Christ. The second promise fits together with the first promise. And it's this, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. And God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation, will provide the way of escape also so that you will be able to endure it. This promise in this text, it applies to every temptation you will ever face in the Christian life, including the temptation, whether you had a good mother or not, including the temptation to not believe the love of God for you in Christ. The promise is that the God who loves you is the God who is faithful to you so that you would have a full and rich experience of that love all the time. You don't have to go around always questioning the love of God for you. There is a way out to keep yourself in the love of God. But what, is that, what does that escape look like from 1 Corinthians 10? Can, can I get a hint? Maybe what does that look like when, when I'm tempted to not believe the love of God for me in Christ? It looks like Romans 5.5. 5. It looks like the cross of Christ. It looks like a bleeding and dying Savior laying down his life so that I can go free, so that I can have eternal life. God's love poured out in me through the death and resurrection of his son. There is no greater answer to that temptation, and there is no more sufficient answer for that temptation. Does he love me? Yes. How do I know? The cross. Not my mom. Not my wife. Though they are beautiful pointers, it is the cross. It is always the cross. It always will be the cross. This is a terrible illustration, but I thought I'd try it anyway. Not everyone is in the kitchen when the cookies are being made. But when the oven dough, when, when the oven timer goes off, everybody gets cookies. Moms are giving us cookie dough in this life. But in the gospel, when the timer goes off, everybody gets cookies. Everybody gets the same cookie. The same infinite love of God in Christ for us. The best our mothers could ever have loved us is but a mere shadow of the infinite love of God for you in Christ. And as you believe that love, and as you fight with the promises of God in the text, not, not just that you read it there, but you take it here and you hold to it and you preach it to yourself, you will become more and more affectionate for people, more and more loving Meaning your capacity, my capacity to believe the love of God for us in Christ is unbounded. There's nothing standing in the way of a full, rich experience of the love of God. And so is our capacity to love each other and unbelievers with great affection, to minister exactly like Paul is describing. So I want you to have that full hope. Forgive, press on, and believe the love of God for you in Christ. Number three. Gospel ministry must be intimate ministry. Verse 8 again. Having so fond affection for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives. Because you had become very dear to us. 
Because of this great affection, there was great action. Intimacy, meaning closeness, proximity. Paul lists two actions here. First, he says that we, that we were well-pleased. The word means delighted to give you the gospel. This is the means that God uses to bring salvation. The message, God's message, that Christ died once for all. He died for sins once for all so that he might bring us to God. And he was raised on the third day for the forgiveness of our sins that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have this eternal life that he is promising. The second action of the text, though, builds on the first. Not only the gospel, but because we loved you and you were so dear to us, we also imparted to you our own lives. Our very souls is the idea. There was an intimacy, a closeness of us to you, Paul is saying. So you could not only hear the gospel, you could see it in us. There is the sense of we held nothing back from you in this gospel ministry. We gave you all of us. We immersed ourselves into your experience, you Thessalonians. Sometimes we babysit friends, babies at our house. And as they leave, the mother will say, she'll pause and say, I've never left my baby before. And to get her over that threshold and get her out the door to go have dinner with her husband is a really difficult thing. Why is that? It's because motherhood is intimate ministry. It is immersive. It is all-consuming. It is the giving of our lives, and that is exactly, precisely how gospel ministry must be. Why must gospel ministry be that way? Because that is the way of Christ. What could be more immersive than the incarnation of Christ? The identification of Jesus with us. He comes and he lives among us as one of us. He talks with us and works with us and teaches us and takes upon himself the burden of our sins and goes and ascends the cross and dies for us. He emptied himself out in life and in death. Was not Christ one of us and among us a friend of sinners? In whatever ministry we engage in, we have the privilege then and the responsibility, like mothers, but ultimately like Christ, to enter into the lives of other people, whatever the sacrifice, and there live out the gospel in word and deed. That should provoke us and inspire us to get off the couch and start pouring our lives out into other people. And do it with great gentleness and great affection. One commentator said, a gospel messenger who stands detached from his audience has not yet been touched by the very gospel he proclaims. And so who are your children? Who do you agonize over, whether they stand or whether they fall? Who are you giving your life to with gentle, intimate affection? Paul says in 2 Corinthians eleven twenty eight, 28, who is weak without my being weak? Who is led into sin without my intense concern? All that is is the expression of what he's saying in 1 Thessalonians 2. I gave my life to you. I wed myself to you in this gospel endeavor so that where you suffer, I suffer. If you stand, I stand. If you fall, I fall. He was so identified with them. Paul was a spiritual father and a spiritual mother to so many people. And this is precisely the way that Christ feels of us. Do you think he cares whether you stand or fall? Whether you're weak or strong, of course, of course he does. And gospel ministry, ministry is to look and feel just like that. A few points of application. First is this. Moms, thank you. Mothers, keep up the good work. Keep giving us cookie dough in a metaphorical sense. Your ministry and service is not and never will be in vain. Teach your children Christ and show your children exactly what Paul is saying here. The gentle, tender, affectionate love of Christ. John Wesley said, I learned more about Christianity from my mother than from all the theologians of England. Second, for all of us, minister like a mother. Not only like a mother, but don't miss the heart of God displayed in motherhood. Intimate, affectionate, gentle. And then thirdly, for for those in leadership in this church, pastors and deacons, may the analogy of motherhood 
inform and guide our ministry here. May it look like this, by God's grace, gentle, tender, affectionate, endearing, intimate love. Fourthly, future missionaries. If you're considering going into the mission field, study the word of God. Be ready in season and out to study and preach and teach the word of God. But do not lose sight of people, of faces and souls and individuals just like the Thessalonians who were captured not just by the gospel message, but the gospel message given in the context of affectionate gospel messengers as God used both working together to bring faith. And then fifthly, finally, for unbelievers, if you're not a Christian this morning, I want you to know and wrestle with what your mom can't give you. Your mom cannot give you eternal life. Your mom may have given you everything else in this life, but she cannot secure you to heaven. In John 3, Jesus tells a really smart religious man that he has to be born again if he is to enter into the kingdom of heaven. And the man very rationally says, how how can a man be born when he's old? He cannot enter into his mother's womb a second time and be born, can he? And then Jesus goes on to explain Every person is born physically. Every person sitting here right now listening is alive physically. Your heart is beating. But not everyone here is alive spiritually. There's a darkness, there's a death inside of us. And it's our rebellion to God. And there's only one way to remedy that and mom can't help. The only way to not be just born physically, but to be alive to God spiritually, to be born again, is to look to Christ by faith and to believe of this Christ who died for our sins and was raised again on the third day and trust him. And his great promise is that he will give you eternal life. Mom brought you into this life and loved you dearly. But mom can't save you, only Christ can do that. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your infinite wisdom in the way you have designed two genders, marriage, motherhood, fatherhood. God, thank you for all that it preaches to us and shows us in our experience. Thank you for this text this morning. God, thank you for your spirit as he leads us in this, conforming us to Christ, empowering us into this kind of gospel ministry. God, we need to grow in this. All of us need to grow in this. And I pray that you would help us to grow in this. And that, and that that desire to grow would be born out of a rock solid, firm belief in your great affection for us in Christ. God, thank you for each person here. God, especially for those that don't know Christ, I pray that this Mother's Day you would give them life as they look to Christ by faith. In Jesus' name, amen.